Hello everyone and welcome to my channel Needed Art History where well I will be sitting telling you some stories about art history uh, while occasionally knitting. Well today I will be just sitting and talking to you because I haven't started any new project so I don't physically have anything to knit so yeah but I think, well, this is not the most important part of, <laughs> of um, my channel. Welcome to the first video on this channel. So today I decided, well, I decided I will start this channel with uh, the art of, uh, well, one of my favorite artists, so one of the artists that I really admire a lot and, uh, well, was very surprised when we were learning about him in university and I was, again, was very surprised about his art. And well, today I propose you to, you know, place ourselves a little bit, you know, back in time. Let's travel to the end of 14th century, the start of 15th century. And today uh, I want to tell you about uh, Jan van Eyck, uh, the Dutch painter, uh, a very important figure in art history and just, I think, overall in new history. And he, well, uh, he is considered to be the pioneer of Renaissance in the Netherlands, not just in Netherlands, just overall North Europe. And well, there is this term, uh, North Renaissance. So it was made up by uh, the one of actually very great researcher, Erwin Panofsky, and I mean actually really recommend you to read him. He has actually the book that is, the name of the book is Northern Renaissances, uh, so yeah, where he describes the art of Northern uh, West Europe. Really recommend you, his works also about Italian art also recommend, so he's, you know, he has a very um, easy uh, writing style, so you will not, you know, you won't be confused about anything and so well, yeah so again really really, really recommend your works of Edwin Panofsky. Well, let's start to talk about Jan van Eyck. Uh, so I will start with one of the like fun fact about him so he is considered to be the first Flemish master to sign his works and uh, he's uh, like motors, a lot of researchers call it, uh, sounds like as I can, uh, which is uh, considered to be like a little pun on his name, Jan van Eyck, so which is kind of clever. And well, yeah, so we can find this uh, this uh, sign on one of the works, uh, one of his portraits, well, not his, the portrait that he made, uh, the man in red turban of 1433. We'll be talking about this a bit later. And so, well, uh, we don't know his exact uh, date of birth, but uh, researchers of his art, they narrowed down the dates uh, uh, to 1380-1390, so he was born somewhere in this decade. And, uh, well, it is widely believed, uh, and it was believed for centuries, uh, and it is still the main version that uh, he and, uh, well, uh, actually I will mention it here already, that. Uh, Jan van Eyck had a brother, Hubert van Eyck, and it is considered that uh, van Eyck brothers were born in the city of Maaseik, where that's where the name is coming from, uh, but um, some of researchers are actually, you know, providing some kind of, you know, weak evidences that uh, they could be the residents of the city Maastricht, uh, but again, as I said, it, it's not confirmed. It is widely believed that, uh, and, and we will take this in consideration, we be will believe in this, that uh, they were the residents of uh, Maasek. Basically, what is, you know, uh, very important and very uh, distinctive of Van Eyck is that, well, uh, we know for a fact that he was, uh, well, he was a uh, educated and clever man. And that means that he was familiar with uh, his contemporary art, uh, the art of previous ages, uh, with, uh, he was familiar with uh, his uh, contemporary colleagues, and he was, you know, he was taking all of the inventions that those people made, this, uh, those are, for example, so like such a, uh, I mean, all of the names that I will uh, name, <laughs> uh, they are a very important figures in history of art, and they are a, uh, pioneers in a lot of things, uh, like in their own niches. So uh, we know that uh, Van Eyck was fond of Limburg Brothers, they were uh, book illuminators. Uh, we know that he was fond of Altermaster, Melchior Broderlam, uh, 
uh, and also we know that he uh, was familiar with art of Master of Le Mal, whose name was uh, Robin Campan. Uh, so yeah, so he was, you know, he was uh, looking into these artworks, he was uh, uh, like maybe analyzing, you know, in his head and something, but he was basically, as I said, taking all of this invention and he was then redoing them, he was, he was putting it through his own prism, you know, of his own visions and, uh, well, it led him to create a completely new realistic art, his individual style and, well, yeah, this is why he is so important and this is why he is so so interesting. It is believed that Jan van Eyck started his journey as a book mini miniaturist, uh, well, book illuminator, and uh, well, uh, the first uh, time we learn about Jan van Eyck as an artist is uh, uh, when uh, he became valet de chambre uh, for Johann of Bavaria, and so Johann of B Bavaria, he uh, hired Jan van Eyck in 1422-24 uh, for decorating his castle, uh, but also it is known that in this period of time Van Eyck created one of the manuscripts which is now known by the name of Turin Milan Hours and uh, well unfortunately the original manuscript uh, burned down in uh, 1804 there was like a big fire back then uh, and unfortunately we lost the original as I said but we have the black and white facsimile uh, and we know that uh, Jan van Eyck created seven miniatures there and well this is also where the um, problems with attribution starts because uh, some of the uh, some of the researchers believe that some of the works were made by Hubert van Eyck, uh, some by Jan, but it is very, very hard to attribute something to Hubert, but we will be, you know, about problems with attribution we'll be talking about late when we'll be talking about Ghent Alter. Uh, well, yeah, so uh, here I would highlight one of the works, which is called The Swimming of St. Julian and Martha. And well, here, what is new? First of all, new is that uh, Jan van Eyck started to actually, you know, understand the perspective. He was observant enough, you know, to understand that uh, what Italians were doing was a bit wrong, because uh, when you, like yourself, you can also, I think, uh, successfully answer to this question that when you are watching uh, at a distance, right, things are not uh, very contrast, things are not so uh, dark, uh, it's actually in the contrary. Things start to be this little foggy, more in this bluish greenish palette. So this is what Jan van Eyck actually observed and he was like, well, this is how we need to show because as I said, Italians, they were actually showing like the uh, things on distance in this darkish brownish colors uh, and the things that were near us the viewers they were showing in this more bluish greenish colors and it needs to be in, in reverse you know but again Italians came to uh, to the conclusion that it needs to be in reverse by you know they were very logical they were uh, like almost scientific researchers I'll say like this while uh, well, Flemish artist and Jan van Eyck himself, uh, he came to this more with, you know, with his intuition, uh, which is, I mean, I, I think I, I don't need to explain to any of you that it is not like a bad thing being more intuitional or more uh, rational. So this is just how, you know, just the different, I mean, at the end of the day, right, each and every came to one conclusion that it needs to be like that. Things that are near you are um, more in the contrast, darker things further away from you uh, are way lighter. So we can uh, point out that uh, he did not try to, you know, engage us viewers into the painting because uh, we basically doesn't have any point uh, uh, under our legs. What I mean is that we can see that, you know, there's just this little, little piece of land which is uh, which he showed in the lower left corner and well basically it does not provide us enough of space to stand there and thus you know we are like as viewers floating just in the air which is you know well maybe he didn't even wanted the viewers to be engaged in the composition i don't think that we can call it some kind of you know, mistake or something like that so yeah later in 1425 he was hired by philip the good and they were, uh, well, he was working on Philip the Good for 16 years uh, and uh, they were in a very, very good relationship and, and I mean it. So Philip the Good was, you know, he was, 
he was respecting Jan van Eyck not just as an artist but as a man just overall and they were um, a very, as I said, very good friends till the end of, of uh, Jan van Eyck's death and uh, Philip the Good believed uh, Jan van Eyck uh, to the point that uh, he uh, made uh, van Eyck a w part of his diplomatic um, wanted to say diplomatic gang <laughs> okay <laughs> well i think it's not the very right word for that but let it be uh and uh, yeah and with um uh, the diplomatic team uh he, jan van eyck uh, traveled to portugal where he actually drew a he, uh, he painted the uh, portrait of king's daughter is found in Fante isabella and well uh king very liked this portrait and uh, which led to a successful marriage of uh, Infanta, not with one age, just overall. Uh, yeah, uh, but then after this uh, travel, uh, he well, obviously was getting back through Spain, and we can actually see that he, you know, he was paying attention to the nature around him uh, because, uh, well, first of all, it, it is understandable, you know, because there is now no. no um, I don't know, uh, like uh, orange trees so, and all of these exotic trees so that are grown into very hot climates. Obviously he was paying attention to this and we can actually see that he used some of this, uh, um, some of this uh, plants on one of uh, his paintings, so I will point this out a little bit later. After this brief travel, so he uh, settled down in Brugge and in 1432 uh, he got married but unfortunately we don't really know anything about his wife we just know that her name was Margaret we don't even know her maiden name because uh, in the contemporary records uh, she was um, referred to as uh, Damoiselle Margaret uh, and well the only thing that researchers you know are pointing out is that she might be from the noble family, uh, from aristocracy, but um, considering and analyzing one of her portraits, like the old, not one of the only portrait, and this is the only female portrait in uh, Van Eyck's art, she was from a, um, well, low nobility, maybe bankrupt um, a nobility, so she wasn't, you know, from a very rich family, something like that, but still, she might be from uh, aristocracy. And, well, as I said, this is <laughs> everything that we know about her. Uh, so they lived together for a little bit less than a decade, and unfortunately on July 9th, so 1441, uh, Jan van Eyck died. And here, this uh, where uh, the good relationship with Philip the Good is uh, popping up, because... Um, uh, Philip the Good, uh, he uh, started to take care of uh, now widow uh, and their kids. Uh, so yeah, so he was providing her financially and again just overall supporting her financially. So this is how he maybe you know um, showed his respect again to Jan van Eyck. Before diving in into his art straight, I want actually to stop on one thing. Uh, let's make things clear. So, um, there was this author, uh, Giorgio Vasari. He's very well known in art history world. He was an artist himself, but he is more well known for writing, um, for writing artist biographies. So he was writing about his contemporaries, about you know previous artists also, but uh, most important is what he was writing about his contemporaries. So he was a uh, he lived in 16th century, but still you know he was writing about Van Eyck also because as I said, Van Eyck was uh, remembered for a century as one of the most you know cleverest person and yeah inventor of a lot of things. And one of this invention, which was uh, well. Uh, Vasari wrote it like this, that Jan van Eyck invented oil painting. Well, little spoiler, he's not. Uh, but uh, uh, we now know, obviously, that it's, uh, well, as I said, it's not true. Because oil painting technique, you know, it was... Uh, uh, it was well known throughout all of the Middle Ages and before that. They, it just, you know, people had no idea how to use them right. The, I mean, oil paint. That's why they were more fond of tempera, well, um, the watercolor, you know, the uh, hot wax painting. So, uh, yeah. Uh, 
Uh, and well, it is uh, now it is believed that uh, he is named as the uh, inventor of oil painting because, uh, as you would see, uh, he managed to develop this technique in such a high level. And well, basically that we know now, you know, that artists are studying still now and that's how they're painting also now with this paint. And uh, we now know all of the advantages of oil paint and it is all uh, thanks to Jan van Eyck. So this is why it is believed Vasari thought and Vasari wrote that Jan van Eyck invented, uh, invented oil painting. But again, as I said, he's not, he did not, I mean, technically he did not make oil paint. What he made was uh, actually, well, it is believed that he uh, indeed developed uh, such a thing called uh, Flemish painting technique. So here I think I will stop, you know, and tell you in details what is that. Well, so what is this about? Very, you know, time consuming uh, method, but at the end, you know, the result, I think it worth it. The most important thing about Flemish uh, painting technique is that your uh, like canvas or that was back then most uh, likely it was uh, wooden panels uh, they needed to be primed with white was well, with white primer and this white primer is like um, the most important thing in the painting uh, and in preparation to your future painting uh, before starting working uh, directly on your on your panel uh, again uh, on white primed panel you would have to prepare the um, on a paper the co your composition so i mean if like you had the painting like this you needed to take the paper like this and you needed to do your composition in uh, full scale after that well i think that yes i think that i will you know, it will be very um, easier to understand so for example so you need to like your painting will be this size so this is your um well the, you know, it's hard to call those things sketch because they were already like, you know, on their own, like a artworks, um, but well, let, let's technically call it a sketch, right? So, and you would prepare it with like all of the details that you want, right? So what, um, what you would do, what you would do. Uh, so, I mean, imagine this is not in color, nothing, they were not doing it in color, they were just doing it, you know, this, uh, like, linear things, ju just lines, and after that, so you made your composition, it's now ready, you would turn your paper, uh, and then you would uh, take check roll, and you would place your check roll on the back of your painting, of your preparation painting, and then you would um, put uh, this side with check roll to your prepared to uh, panel and then you would take some kind of you know in modern modern words like pen uh, but basically something uh, that something not very sharp so you would not you know make a cut in your painting and in, in your board uh, and then so you would take like, this uh, uh, pen and you would transfer your painting this preparation uh, by lines on the canvas and well this is the this is actually, you know, I think a very clever method. So, I mean, I'm myself using it sometimes and I know that, well, this is a secret for uh, a lot of artists. <laughs> uh, and, uh, well, yeah, so after that, after that, so we made a preparation, we uh, transferred our painting on the, on the canvas. And uh, after that, you would take a very, you know, liquidy uh, brown paint and you would put it um, with a very, very thin layer on your whole canvas. Again, the important thing is that you had to put the, um, it's a, like in very thin layer because the, again, the whiteness of your canvas still needed to be seen because the white is the most important here. Then, it, then there will be also some processes. I will not, you know, torture your mind if uh, this, uh, uh, under like laying, I don't know if to call it right in English. I'm sorry. Of this burn, of this brown painting would would be done in like temperate, and then there will be another processes of preparing it to work with oil. If you would straight go with oil, then you know it was not so hard. To, so there was a little bit less of um, actions. But well, we will skip this also, and we will just get to the part of the painting. Then when you started to work on your painting, so you you know 
and now you need to put colors contrast or just overall you need to put volume right um, then you would start to work in this technique that is called glaze or glazing which basically means that you would work with a very very thin layers of paint and uh, thus with these thin layers it will be uh, your, your layer of white and this brownish color it will be seen through some of the parts of painting and thus making it look like you know the, the painting is like shining through uh, it, through itself as i said a very time consuming process because uh, this glazing technique is uh, um, well for example you know let's, let's uh, like this is the thing that i know for a fact that uh, Titian, for example, an Italian painter, uh, he was uh, well actually well known also for this type of technique, except of his colors. And it is known that with some of his uh, painting, it is uh, there is more than ninety, like nine zero layers of uh, paint. So and when you when you work in this technique, you need you know each and every layer need to be dry. You cannot work straight on the steel. Um, wet paint so yeah so this is why it's time consuming advantages of this method is that uh, your painting was glowing from the inside and uh, well and there is this also thing called italian painting technique and well the mo the main uh, difference is that uh, i mean obviously there's also this very long process as in the flemish painting technique but italian the most uh, like distinctive uh, difference is that Italians were using uh, colorful primers, so it was mostly the uh, tell me not tell you the grayish one and uh, this uh, brownish reddish, you know, very dark uh, tones. So yeah, because Italians were working more on contrast, they were using uh, more like this um, thing like uh, chiaroscuro which is, you know, Da Vinci is well known for this, like, uh, the Mona Lisa is so uh, well... He used a lot of this technique, which is basically, you know, the plane with um, uh, light and dark. Uh, Rembrandt, after that, he also was well known, and he used also, he used mostly the grayish uh, primers on his paintings. So, well, yeah, so this is the main difference. Let's start talking about his art from his religious pieces. So, uh, well, I uh, highlighted just some of them, just some that are very well known, that I myself uh, like very much. And, uh, uh, well, um, well, let's start with uh, the first one. So, I'm, I'm sorry, I will be looking at the screen of my laptop, obviously, because I have these paintings here in front of me. Now, before we will start with one painting, I just wanted to say that he was one of the first painters who was like, uh, if I want to show heaven or just overall everything that is um, associated with heaven, uh, basically what I need to do is just depict Earth in its uh, best appearance. And well, I will point out about this also in some of the paintings. Now let's start with one of the works which I very like myself. It's Madonna in the Church, approximately 1425, so it is believed to be one of his earliest works. And, uh, well, originally that was a two-pieces uh, uh, diptych, but unfortunately the second piece we don't know where it is, maybe it is destroyed, maybe it, is, it was stolen, so, um, but I don't think it's, uh, don't get me wrong, uh, you know, it's very important because most likely the second wing was uh, depicting uh, the customer, but, uh, well, <laughs> um, in terms of art, I think, uh, the art itself is way more important than the person that customized it. Uh, so yeah, so what we have here? Uh, well, first of all, you know, I want to point out the the light here. Here, it is very soft light, right? It doesn't blind you. And uh, overall, just the whole composition, I think you want to look at it again and again. And this very, uh, like, domestic-like, I would say, even like this. The also interesting thing about light is that this light is coming from the nodes, which is like not a typical phenomenon, right, in the world, uh, which leads to make some assumption that uh, that this is how Van Eyck wanted to show that this light is not from the real world, that this is a divine light. Very interesting thing, you know, this little detail that you might not even... I mean, uh, I am myself really uh, a bad... Uh, 
I don't really understand where north, where south, you know, and how to understand uh, when you're just standing in the forest, for example, and, you know, people will be like, oh, there, north is there. And I'm like, well, how do you know that? This is, yeah, I'm in a club of this type of people. So, uh, so if I would not read about this in, like, one of the sources, you know, when I was preparing this work for, I mean, this uh, subject for my university class, and I was like, well, okay, I wouldn't pay attention to this at all if I would see, you know, this thing, uh, I mean, with my own eyes. So, so I just think it's uh, it worth to point out uh, because I believe that not a lot of you actually also understand where is north, where is east and all of these things. So, yeah, so this is, you know, like this little small detail that you may not even pay attention if you are not very familiar with uh, uh, well, with these distances. Yeah. Also, we can see, you know, that he still has this um, um, old style because, well, technically we are still in a Gothic period, right? So for a Gothic period is considered to be from 12th century till, uh, well, actually 15th, but some of research says, well, I know that Western Europe considers to be after, um, till actually even uh, 16th century, but, you know, well, the, the thing with periodization is kind of confusing uh, on its own, so I will not uh, point it out here, but what I want to say that uh, we see some um, Gothic uh, features here, not just in the church, because obviously it's a Gothic church with this voltages and all of this stuff. Well, again, I, I hope I, I got it right in, in English. Uh, but, well, yeah, you can see we are in a Gothic uh, church. Except of that, what is also pointing out to the Gothic style is uh, the figure of Mary herself, because her silhouette is having this like little S-type uh, figure. So this is one of the distinctive features um, of Gothic art. Uh, the figures in this period were elongated and they, uh, a lot of them had this yeah, S-type uh, uh, shapes. What is um, actually, I think, um, quite nice here is that when I first uh, looked at this painting, I obviously, uh, you know, my eyes uh, caught up on Mary straight. Uh, but then I, uh, you know, and I was like, look, and I was like, oh, this is a very amazing painting. But then I was like, well, something is wrong after, you know, like two, three seconds. And then I was like, oh, well, obviously wrong because Mary is like the size of the church. So, you know, her proportion is blown up. And so she's completely disproportional toward the, uh, the place, the surrounding that she's in. Uh, and, well, it is also completely logical uh, because, uh, well, first of all, Mary is considered to be the Queen of Heaven, right? And first and second of all, she is considered to be the embodiment of church. And plus, we understand that, well, all of this situation is going on, you know, the light from the north and the some, like, enormous figure of Mary uh, is uh, saying us that the customer that probably was on the second uh, wing, uh, uh, he obviously he doesn't see this in real life so this is just his vision while he's in church praying meditating you know doing whatever like, uh, you're doing in church so yes yeah, so, you know these little details uh, that you may not even pay attention to but they're making a lot of things will or well way more th sense to the painting if you were just you know go go and just look at this and well, and, and what and nothing let's move on uh let's move on uh, to well the painting that I was very, very blown away with. That's why I chose actually uh, Jan van Eyck back then to prepare uh, this material about him because I saw the work that he is painting, uh, Madonna of Cancel Roland. I was really blown away about this work because I don't think that that was, you know, previously before Jan van Eyck such type of portraits, and after that because uh, imported, I mean, of uh, Councillor Roland and just overall his face. Just look at his face. Uh, I, th I mean, it really looks like I'm looking at a real and a live person in terms of like the how skillfully he uh, portrayed the individual traits of this uh, this man. So it really looks for me, you know, like a photography. This painting is also, is so, I mean, at first glance, you know, you just see this uh, enormous figures of uh, our main characters on the first plan near us. But uh, if you will, you know, dive into the painting, again, you see what he's doing here, how he's uh, 
making his painting more deeper, deeper, deeper with this type of perspective and plus making the mountains in the back uh, uh, this um, bluish color. This painting was commissioned by Cancelo Roland himself uh, because um, he was, uh, so he negotiated uh, the conquest of Arras, which is uh, like this um, peace, peace tra treaty, treaty, how do you call it, right? Uh, between Philip the Good and Charles the uh, Seventh, and uh, he uh, so Constant Roland he as I said customized this painting and he placed it then in uh, his family chapel in the church of Notre Dame du Chastel. Uh, but in 1805 this painting was moved to Louvre and now it is in Louvre. So what we can see, the Chancellor uh, Roland, he's like praying, meditating on this uh, like book of hours or whatever it is, this holy scripture. And uh, obviously we can understand that this is just his vision, this is not for real. Uh, we can see also that baby Jesus, he's a part of the, holding the cross. His, um, his arm is in this, you know, a gesture of blessing, so he's blessing Councillor Roland. Now let me point out some of the interesting things on this painting. So first of them is that Councillor Roland is situated on the left. In terms of iconography, it's not right. This type of composition and, situ and the placement of the characters led uh, some of researchers actually to, um, you know, to provide some versions about the, um, that, uh, all of this is going on, as I said, in heaven, and this is not a real world. Uh, thus, all of this is going on right in front of the eyes of the God, uh, which, uh, well, I'm, I'm not calling us viewers the God, no, respectfully, uh, but we can just imagine, you know, that we are viewers, we're standing, we're looking at this painting, and just the just God is like behind our backs, or we are behind the God, you know, so like looking at all of this, and. Uh, and thus, uh, well, this is just my point of view, that we can say that then it, I mean, it will make sense, right, if we will place it uh, like this, that if we will just basically, if we would put ourselves um, behind the, the, the Counselor Roland and Mary with Jesus, uh, then the composition will be right. What shows us that he he haven't done it uh, because you know he was arrogant or something like this. It's the reliefs on the columns behind them because there on these reliefs, Jan van Eyck made the images of seven scenes. So yes, yeah, so this is uh, you know there is the uh, subject of uh, expulsion of Adam and Eve from paradise, killing of Abel by Cain. Near Mary, there is the subject of. Trajan's justice, which is basically the subject, like very, very briefly, is that one of the women she came to Trajan, she asked for retribution for the death of her son, and well, the emperor Trajan said, well, um, no, uh, the son of this woman was killed by son of Trajan, and thus Trajan said, well, you can take my son instead of like yours, dad. At some of the column, you would see this little, little image uh, of squished under the column rabbits, which in the Middle uh, Ages was the sign of lust. So, yeah, so, you know, a lot of different things. Another very interesting thing is this painting is the, well, is the uh, landscape itself. So, first, uh, this is also one of the distinctive features of uh, Jan van Eyck's works. He provided these uh, landscapes into his paintings. And as I said previously, that uh, he understood that if he wanted to show heaven, he needed just to show, uh, like in all of the bloom, the real cities, the real earth. And well, here is the point also. So uh, there is some debate what type of city it is, because, uh, well, uh, that might be, you know, Brugge, that might be another thing. Also, I just remembered one thing that uh, you would see like straight in the center of the composition where these two men are standing on the, on the balcony that I will mention now in a second. Uh, uh, there's a bridge and uh, there's a little cross. So I am telling you, I have no recollection of this story at all. I just remember that uh, that uh, there were some kind of things going on back then in political life and some guy was uh, basically crucified on the, this bridge but i don't recollect at all in what city it happened or something like this and a lot of researchers you know thus they are making uh assumption that this might be the city because of this cross on the bridge because that was quite literally the real thing that happened back then in in one x lifetime another thing uh, and the last thing that i will point here is well actually these two men so 
uh, because I want to point at this one little guy with red turban and I want you actually to uh, remember him because there will be not the first time and not the last time when we would met the guy in red turban which uh, led us actually to believe that, I mean, on next works we will see why, that it might be actually Van Eyck himself, so he was, you know, putting himself in his own paintings, which is actually uh, also some kind of a very progressive uh, thing in, in art, because, well, previously uh, most of the artists that were not, you know, in Middle Ages, it is believed that uh, uh, yeah, the art uh, is uh, anonymous, but it's not, you know, it's not 100% true because we have signed works, we have uh, works with um, uh, such a self-portraits or like um, believed self-portraits. And also interesting thing is that near this man we can see the uh, two uh, peacocks and some of magpies. Uh, and peacocks were is uh, they are the believed symbol of Jesus, and it is you know starting from the Roman catacombs. And uh, while uh, magpies are considered to be you know the evil creatures, we can talk about you know this fight between uh, maybe even like some kind of comparison, something like that between the evil and. Uh, good. There's way way more information about this work, so I hope that I you know just made you interested in that, and you will also just go and uh, study yourself and just see what you can spot on. The next work that I want to look in is uh, the Virgin and Child with Canon van der Pelle. So Canon van der Pelle, he was actually the commissioner of this work, and this type of like composition, this type of work is considered actually to be like the biggest in Van Eyck's art. Uh, this is not his like biggest, biggest uh, uh, like overall art because the biggest piece of art is Ghent Alter. But in terms, you know, of this type of uh, things, uh, this is considered to be his biggest work, and uh, so it is uh, meter 41, oh, 41 on meter seventy six. So you can imagine the scale <laughs> of the work. And uh, well, uh, again, this is the type of work that you can just stand and you just can, you know, look into that for like a good 15 20 minutes. But I will just point out the people on the painting. So, on the left is Saint Donatian, and he was the Bishop of Reims, and actually uh, the cathedral in which this uh, painting was situated for. Uh, a lot of years was uh, dedicated to him, so uh, Virgin Mary with Jesus, obviously, and I think actually we can see the resemblance with previous work, so, you know, he definitely has some kind of, I mean, Van Eyck, uh, some kind of type for <laughs> Virgin uh, and for Jesus, and uh, uh, from the right is, as I said, um, Canon van der Pelle himself, the costumer himself, with uh, Saint uh, George, and uh, Saint George, why Saint George? Because uh, Van der Palle, he considered to considered uh, Saint George to be his uh, heavenly patron. Uh, but the most interesting thing on this painting, what I want to paint, uh, the point out, and then we will move on, is that uh, uh, you know. Again, this is such a detail that I do believe that, you know, if I would be uh, in a museum myself and I would just uh, look at this, I will never ever actually spot it, which is um, not really thinking you know, a good uh, thing to say for a bachelor in art history, but well, well, as it is, you know, I'm being truthful here. Uh, so in so this uh, St. George, he has a shield uh, on his back and in this shield, in the reflection of the shield, we actually can see a little small figure, uh, which is uh, at first point, I don't even think you can understand that it is a figure, but uh, this is the figure uh, with a red turban again, uh, which I, as I said previously, which leads us, you know, to really think that, uh, um, that that could be Jan van Eyck himself. This type of thing, you know, it's also it's interesting because it's um, it shows um, that uh, well uh, the skills of the artist. Because I think if uh, some of you are painters yourself, you understand how and well, but I mean just overall, also you people understand how hard it is to paint reflections and uh, well to make them look adequate <laughs> and the second of all it's a very interesting little small just this um, micro detail to connect the world of the painting with the world of the viewers because 
uh, this is clearly a little small piece, a little detail that is not from the painting, right? So it is going on from outside world. And outside wor world, in this case, is our viewer's world. So this is, uh, you know, the little piece that engaged ourselves into the painting and we, uh, without even, you know, maybe knowing, understanding, paying attention to that, became the part of the painting became the part of the composition so yes yeah, so very interesting and very clever is uh, uh, for my point of view and now let's move on to well the most famous work of Jan van Eyck the Ghent altarpiece uh, so this is as I said from all and all of his work is considered to be the biggest uh, piece uh, which is uh, like three meter in height and when it's opened it has uh, something around five or like a little bit more than five meters uh, so yeah you can imagine right the scale of this works um, but before diving into the art and before I will you know point out to you some of the little small details here and just overall explain the composition and what we're seeing uh, uh, let's uh, dive into a little historical fact so this piece has an inscription uh, which uh, uh, says that uh, the work was begun by Hubert van Eyck, the, the artist about whom there is none, and finished by his brother Jan, the second in art. Now it is known that this inscription was made in 16th century, so um, the altarpiece was finished in 1432, thus it's 15th century, and so it was made after the death of Jan van Eyck, and obviously Hubert also. Till 1950s it was believed that uh, indeed this altarpiece was uh, started by uh, Hubert, uh, and uh, Jan van Eyck just finished overall the work because Hubert died. Some of the researchers, uh, they uh, well started to ask questions, you know, was there Hubert at all? You know, started to show this um, ideas that well maybe you know Jan van Eyck was actually the only one there were no brothers or no, nothing he finished all of his works on his own and well which is you know a kind of uh, also a strange thing because uh, why uh, why van Eyck would uh, you know make this type of speculations and rumors about himself and you know create this type of situation uh, you know what is it, what is the benefits of all of this so you know uh, but this is, I will not stop here because there's a uh, poor speculations and, you know, we can get into this um, uh, conspiration theories hole, so and this is not what it is about and this is not what I want to talk about. As I mentioned, uh, 1950s, so in 1951-52 uh, there were a restoration of this work. And, well, restorers actually I came to this conclusion that, um, you know, by analyzing all of these uh, different pieces of this uh, artwork and all of this stuff, uh, and by the wood also, like analyzing the wood, um, they uh, came to conclusion, as I said, that this piece was actually made by one person, which is most likely Jan van Eyck, obviously. So, again, which is what leads us to, like, pose some questions why... You know, uh, what is this inscription about and why it's like that. And now let's, uh, well, talk about art. So as I said, grandiose work, and I mean, you can see. Uh, and um, the overall composition of this um, art piece uh, includes uh, 330 characters. Uh, but this is not the most impressive thing, uh, well, I mean, as for me. Uh, the most impressive thing is that uh, none of these 330 characters have the same face. Uh, so basically, which is, I mean, a very, very uh, new thing for, I mean, considering again that this is uh, the first part of 15th century. I mean, back in Middle Ages, back then, that was, uh, well, the artists were not really paying attention to, you know, give uh, different characters uh, completely different uh, portrait features. Uh, and uh, thus this is some new thing but uh, you see we are not talking about he most probably uh, he did not try you know to show some kind of individuality of all of these characters except of maybe the not maybe except of the costumers of this uh, altarpiece um, so this is not about him studying people's individuality or something like that but uh, just uh, overall it's very impressive and it's very important that you know he started to rec recognize the fact that uh, like 
we need to show people with uh, <laughs> different faces and not just you know having the overall pattern like this uh, of faces and just you know put these faces on different clothes. When the altar is closed, uh, the thing what we are seeing on this external wings. Uh, in the first row, this is the um, customers. They are situated near the uh, near two statues, uh, which are made in this technique called uh, grisail, and uh, and it's actually believed. I forget to mention this that uh, he took this um, idea of you know putting these grisail figures uh, on his um, external wings of altar pieces from Robert Campen that I mentioned uh, previously at the start. So yeah, so this is the figure, so on the left, this is uh, the John the Baptist, and uh, on the right is, uh, is John the Apostle. This is the only section where everything is going on in the real world, because everything about this and inside, this is definitely the, well, the, the vision of the donators, or the, well, in external links here, so all of this is like the vision of the donator. The row is, um, uh, we can see the subject of Annunciation, uh, where there is uh, the, um, the Virgin, uh, the Mary, and uh, here it's uh, from the left is Gabriel. Uh, and uh, well, uh, well, he made it actually with one acre very interestingly in terms of. Um, of composition because you know we cannot really understand if Mary sees Gabriel or he or she just can hear him uh, but uh, well she definitely feels something because she raised her gaze at the Holy Spirit which is this uh, little uh, white dove uh, about her head and again here we can see that he put the, um, the landscape of the city uh, into this uh, painting and what is actually important in not like important, interesting, um, is that if you would you know pay attention and you would see that uh, he actually made the uh, shadows from this like uh, I don't know what to call it right poles maybe right, uh, but well that means you know that he also he he's trying to um, connect the real world with the uh, uh, fictional with this visionary wor world. Uh, by just the shadowing, this means that you know the light is coming on from the inside wor world into the painting, which is again very very clever. And the last row on the left, uh, be, uh, no, what, not be, about about uh, Gabriel is Prophet uh, Zachariah. About Mary is uh, Prophet Micha. And uh, these two women that are situated in the center is two Sibyls. Uh, one. Uh, so uh, one uh, near the uh, Gabriel is uh, Erythrean Sibyl and one near Mary is uh, Kumean, I'm sorry for this pronunciation, uh, Kumean Sibyl. Uh, Sibyls is um, basically prophetesses or uh, oracles in ancient Greece. Now let's, well, let's open the, <laughs> let's open our altar altarpiece and, uh, well, the altar pieces we can see is divided uh, into 12 uh, pieces and so well, they are you know they're placed symmetrically toward each other and well this again the second row is the heaven row you know so this is God himself you can see angels Mary Adam and Eve and all this stuff and the love row is considered to be you know earthly world which is divided into these five panels and in the and you know, and it is made like into this panorama view. So the first, uh, the central panel was uh, actually, you know, what I uh, just saw and I remember that a lot of you actually may know this uh, piece, if not by obviously its name and all of this stuff in terms of art. Uh, a lot of you actually may know this because um, back I think in 2019, 18. Uh, so I mean, it was before pandemic, hundred percent. Uh, there were another restoration made and uh, some cleaning was made to this painting and uh, so they <laughs> cleaned this painting, they cleaned the face of the lamp uh, in the center of this uh, composition and uh, I remember everyone was like, oh my god, why why have you done this? Because there were, like, in the original piece there was this very creepy face 
uh, which is more like you know again this uh, human like face than uh, the the lamp lamby one i think you might remember this piece by this um, little uh, news that were circulating a few years ago uh, but well let's get back in the center is well, the lamp and the lamp is the symbol of jesus also this lamp he is uh, surrounded by angels uh, and um, i will also say that on the left side from the forest there is coming the martyrs uh, and uh, on the right side this is the holy wives uh, uh, so uh, again a little bit lower from the left this is uh, prophets and other people like scientists philosophers you know um, just overall people who just accepted their faith and etc and from the right is uh, this is 12 apostles and uh, the well <clears throat> pardon for my sarcasm but i will use it here the true you know uh, servants of the gospel what i mean is bishops is uh, abbots priests popes and etc and in the uh, two wings on the left, this is the um, right as judges and soldiers of Christ, uh, which are led by St. Martin, St. George and St. Sebastian. And on the right is the holy hermits and pilgrims, uh, which are led by St. Christopher, uh, followed by St. Jacob. Oh, well, actually, again, what I wanted to point out, remember I was saying about the fact that, well, we know for the fact that Jan van Eyck was in Spain and was in Portugal because, uh, uh, well, because of Gen Alter, because you can see on some of the parts, like, on, on, for example, on the right part here, we can see the uh, quite exotic uh, plants. We can see palm trees, for example. Uh, on the middle thing here, this middle part, we can see the orange trees. So, so yes, yeah, so that's how we know that's... Uh, uh, artists were actually traveling uh, somewhere because yeah they were depicting a lot of things a lot of what they you know saw very new things for them uh, into their uh, their hat and they were then they were using it in their paintings so also want to stop on the you know on the um, figures of adam and eve because you can see that they are uh, you know they look like they really do not belong into this painting because they are um, well, they have this feeling you know, that they're also made in this uh, grisal technique but they are not this is not a grisal but still and you can see this dramatic light is you know also depicting them and they're coming from this very dark niches and this is you know this is how um, this is considered to be that they are stepping out of the heaven and we can actually see that adam actually making a little step uh, because eve was you know she looks like she's standing but adam is making like a little step and yeah and they're uh well getting out of the heaven for their sins about gand altar this is there's even more information because there's quite literally book written for this altar so you can actually find a lot and a lot of more of information i would just you know told you there's just overall so you would maybe some of you have the possibility you know to just go around and occasionally see these things uh, and now you you will know what you're looking at now let's uh, let's move on to a little bit to his portrait paintings because there's like not a lot of them at least uh, that that we know you know even though there's this very little um very little uh, portraits of him i will not stop on each and every of him i would just mention that well, he is uh, considered to be one of the greatest portrait portraitists, not just of his time, I think we can call him just uh, in overall art history, uh, because, uh, well, because he was, uh, uh, again, back in his time, that was completely new thing. He was not, you know, trying just blindly copy his models, he was trying to put some individuality in them, and he um, generally tried to look into uh, individual traits of uh, this uh, of his models and thus it led to uh, to interesting results also one important thing you know he was putting his models uh, in three quarters so it's like that he changed you know uh, so he stopped uh, showing his models in the spectral type and he uh, instead showed them in this lumber type i really hope that i translated that right because i somehow i could not find the you know the terminology for this type of thing but i really hope you understand what i mean let me you know uh put your attention to one of the works though the man with the red turban 
again <laughs> again what is this like fourth fourth already mentioning of red turban here so this is why it is believed that because uh, it's believed that this is the self-portrait of Jan van Eyck and uh, this idea has been expressed by Erwin Panofsky because he said he pointed out that it uh, for him it looks like he was not painting uh, someone else uh, he was just looking in the mirror basically and painting his self-portrait and this explains why it's in three quarters and what is the most important this is the first time in art uh, well at least for the last like uh, centuries that uh, the model is making the direct eye contact with us and which is uh, which leads uh, us viewers again engage into the painting and be the part of the painting so yes yeah, so this is the this is one of the greatest innovation of uh, Van Eyck's uh, portrait, uh, portraits and uh, well uh, I will you know leave you here to compare some of the works of um, so the, the work of Jan Van Eyck and the work of Robin Campen uh, which we can see they were made you know almost at the same period of time and you can see so Robert Campen he wasn't considered to be one of the greatest masters one of the most skillful masters but we can see the complete difference right in the works so not that I want you know, to drag down Robert Campen but uh, Campen he just as I said he just made a uh, uh, a copy of uh, the person that he was depicting you see again at one point we can think that well both are depicting just some models right uh, because well Maybe it's uh, Van Eyck's work is a self-portrait, or maybe not, uh, because there is actually one, uh, also one of the versions that it can be the, um, it can be his father-in-law, because again, I will show you the portrait of uh, Margaret uh, near this uh, portrait of uh, of man, and uh, well, I I mean I can see, I don't know about you, but I really do can see uh, some resemblance uh, in their faces, but again. Uh, this is not a confirmed uh, information, not a confirmed thing, so well, one, one of the versions, one of the versions. What I wanted to say that uh, this literal detail, you can think that, well, what is, you know, just the, the gaze, like, but you can see how clearly it changed the whole composition and the perception of the whole composition, because at the first glance, uh, as I said, uh, it looks like you know just a normal guy, just an average guy. Was well, it, it's interesting you know to just look at uh, uh, and to see the face of the past. But I have this feeling that when you are looking at this work, as long as you look at this work, the more complex the the portrait starts to get, and the more withdrawn uh, this human starts to be from you. So this is actually, I think, a a very clever and nice and uh, interesting uh, feeling that a uh, that a uh, artists are giving us as viewers with this at uh, the first glance uh, simple work. So as I said, as I showed you already, this is the only portrait of uh, his wife that we know. So this is the portrait that I was talking that they you know that's why she con she is considered to be the lover nobility. Uh, but uh, let's move on to another one uh, very interesting portrait and one of like I think top three of his uh, uh, artworks of Jan van Eyck's artworks is actually the Ghent altar, the uh, portrait of man in red turban and portrait of Giovanni Arnolfini and his wife. There is like a lot of a lot of things uh, like symbolical things so first of all what is depicted most likely it is depicted the moment of engagement or even marriage. So this type of conclusion was made because we can uh, like by the gestures of the models by the way you know they're holding their hands and by the way that uh, Arnolfini is holding his uh, what is this his right hand so it is I can I think that, like you have this association that this is like we're giving an oath and still in the court this is how we're giving an oath and uh, well that's why it's considered to be uh, the, uh, the not just the family portrait but also you know the some kind of uh, marriage certificate uh, because uh, one of the things also that is very interesting here is the uh, well, you can also you can clearly see the mirror in the middle of the composition and uh, uh, under uh, not under bow this mirror we can see uh, the signature 
uh, which reads here was Jan van Eyck, which is, you know, very like strange thing to write, uh, write uh, into your painting. So it's like in this, so modern uh, vandals are going around and just going alive was here. The front that is, uh, it's written, is uh, said to, um, said that uh, this type of front was using, was used back then in legal documents. So, but again, as far as I remember reading that this is some kind of also some, you know, um, not uh, proven fact, so it still needs to, you know, be, needs um, to work on this a bit. But uh, overall, uh, or another sign uh, I forgot that also can point out that this is the uh, um, engagement or marriage is that uh, uh, pay your attention to the lamp on the ceiling and uh, you can see that there is just this one little candle burning and as you can clearly see there is no need in candles because uh, like the situation is going on in the daylight and this leads to think us uh, that that was made uh, just in terms you know of um, symbol uh, as a sign because it's still again it's still completely the same in our days right because I think if some of you ever were in uh, some of you ever was in church yeah, well people were getting uh, married or your parents were getting married or you were getting married right that you know that uh, people are holding their candles in front of them or there's someone else who's you know getting uh, in in front of the married couple an interesting symbol in terms of marriage is the little dog because still i actually um uh, i am really scared that i will lie for you here but i will tell that uh till i uh, probably maybe the rococo period well i mean it'll be logical because you know rococo is some kind of this like pg rated period in art history um but um, in the middle ages and still in 15 and i think even 16th century uh, the dog is considered actually to be the symbol the emblem of conjugal faith so if you're seeing on the old uh, works uh, the little dogs near the ladies uh, um, the ladies uh, legs uh, that's like a symbol as i said of conjugal faith of uh, the pureness of their marriage and like all this stuff so this is like a very positive symbol. I actually never looked out why it's cons the little dog considered to be this type of uh, the, like positive symbol, but well, uh, yeah, it's you know, the open question. Uh, so, well, yeah, uh, we will stop here because, uh, well, after 1439, Van Eyck uh, have not finished any of his works. Uh, well, at least this, uh, again, what we know. And uh, and as I said, on in 1441, he died. So it's believed that uh, you know he might just have started works, and his uh, like someone else was finishing the, uh, them for him. The next art laid the foundations on which Dutch art developed further, and I think it's safe to say not just Dutch art, but just overall uh, the whole art. So he became. I mean, he was like people were really. I mean, the artists uh, were really fascinated by Van, uh, Van Eyck, the artist of the next century was also fascinated about him. And, well, his art was, you know, an advanced phenomenon of the artistic light of life of his time. I hope that I made you interested in Jan Van Eyck a little bit, or I really hope at least that you find out something new for yourself uh, today. And wanted to say also maybe that, you know, uh, well, I'm not, I, I mean, I'm starting this journey and I'm sort of confused and I really don't also, you know, I'm very shy, I'm not very comfortable at this point now uh, in front of the camera because, you know, I, I like to be behind it more and, uh, but, you know, but, well, I want to share my knowledge, I want to share the thing that I like and uh, overall, yeah, I want to share just uh, what I'm interested in because well I, I don't really have this possibility now because of like uh, certain reasons uh, but uh, yeah well I hope that um, oh and you know also wanted to say that uh, really sorry for my English because I, I think that like, you can clearly clearly hear that this is not my native language and this is not even like my fourth like the second third language so I learned English like this is my fourth language technically 
So yeah, so I, I'm sorry for already a lot of mistakes because I know, I mean, I am redoing this video for you to understand already the third time because I was watching, I was, you know, I was editing, editing, and then I was like, oh my God, how many mistakes you are making with, you know, with this little uh, details like much and many, for example, you know, with the... Uh, with the he and she, this is bear with me because I I don't know why, but you know uh, I am I don't know how to explain to you, but I think that a lot of you will understand what I'm talking about. I somehow have this feeling that he suits more for she and she suits more for he, and I always want to you know call women he and men she, and this is like this is the constant problem with me. So <laughs> yeah, so well I hope with time I hope with next video so this will uh, disappear you know and my english will be get better because well i clearly i don't have anyone to you know to talk now in english and to communicate in english so i'm not uh, using it, like using it myself so you know i'm watching a lot i'm reading a lot of in english but i'm not communicating and i'm this type of person i need to communicate so i would know the language uh so yeah uh so well i hope in, in time it will it will get better but till then really really bear with me uh so well yes yeah, so i will leave you here because i, I believe that it will be not like a very long video uh, but uh, well yeah really wish you a good day really wish you peace and be healthy and well if some of you will stumble upon this video in the night uh, this is the sign for you to go to sleep uh, so yeah uh, so, and I hope actually to see you in the next videos, and uh, yeah, so wish you a good day, good luck, and uh, see you soon, and see you in the next videos. Yeah, again, have a great day, great night, whatever, whatever, whatever you are, and well, bye-bye.